Okay, I've been teasing this one for a while and it's finally time to do it. Video motion detection. This has got to be one of my pet peeves. And I know I say that a lot. I got a lot of pet peeves. I'm sorry. You can leave me a comment down below. Let me know what your pet peeves are. But video motion detection in particular strikes a particular nerve for me because it's so critical to a well-run operation, especially for most organizations who look at video forensically, to have video motion detection configured correctly is a godsend. But it's not, it's not configured correctly a lot of the time, and that causes a lot of strife and aggravation for the end user, and, uh, and then guess who they call? So in this episode, I want to do a deep dive into video motion detection. Whether you're a systems integrator that sets up Genetech systems and you'd like to learn a little bit more about this, uh, or you're an end user and, again, you want to learn more about how your system functions and maybe you can tweak this a little bit, uh, a little bit on your own, I think we can all benefit from a session like this. So let's dive in. So yeah, video motion detection, not always set up correctly, not always set up, <laughs> right? Sometimes it's just off and, uh, you know, you're kind of scratching your head. Now, a couple of caveats here. And again, you can leave a comment down below and let me know how you feel about this topic. But for me, as a physical security professional, board certified physical security professional from the ASIS International Organization, it is my humble expert opinion that you should never, ever, under any circumstance, ever record solely based on motion detection. That is a, uh, a, a, a fundamental truth, right? That, that is a holdover from a bygone era when hard drives were super expensive, they didn't have a lot of retention. I remember when DVRs first came out and like the biggest size hard drive you can get was 40 gigs. Yes, you had to record on motion only because you really didn't have much of a choice. But you also have to remember, we were coming off of uh, analog T160 tapes, right? Time-lapse video recorders that you were lucky if the most you could get was 1,280 hours on a single tape recording one frame per second across 16 cameras. I mean, to go to a digital video recorder, which A, was going to give you better, better video quality and uh, longer retention periods at higher frame rates, you would deal with recording based on motion only because you were you were getting so much more value. In 2021, however... You know, you could go out and buy a one terabyte hard drive for peanuts uh, these days, comparatively speaking, right? I mean, I think we can go on on the internet right now and find a one terabyte hard drive for probably well under a hundred dollars. So storage and uh, the cost of storage is no longer a a reason to record based on motion only. If you want to only be alerted to when there are motion-based events in your organization, that's fine. We can set that up. And I'm in this video, I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. But you should be recording continuously, 24-7, 365 across all of your cameras. Do they have to be recording full tilt, 4K resolution, 30 frames per second all the time? No. And uh, maybe future video will do schedules and, and how you can change your recording parameters based on a schedule. I'll do a little bit of that today in this episode. But by and large, you should be recording all the time and have motion events enabled. And again, I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. Now, you might ask, why record continuously, right? If, if motion detection is there, why wouldn't I use it to record only when motion is detected? I mean, theoretically, I could save a tremendous amount of hard drive space. And, you know, instead of recording for 30 days, maybe I'll get 45 or 60 days. And you're right. But again, putting my expert hat on here for a second, I guarantee you, and I don't care if it's Genetech 
or anyone else that uh, makes video management systems, the technology of video motion detection is not 100% foolproof. Do some do it better than others? Yeah. Do I think Genetech does it really, really well? Yes, I do. But invariably, it will miss something. And according to Murphy's Law, the thing that it will miss is the thing that you are looking for. So by recording continuously, yeah, you're going to lose out on those extra 15 or 20 days of recording, but you're going to have everything that you recorded. Now, chances are in your organization, if something happened in one of your facilities, you should know about this within hours to days to maybe a couple of weeks. If you don't know that some critical event happened in your facility in 30 days, which is sort of the, the, the video industry standard, right? 30 days of retention. Then you really ought to be looking at your policies and procedures, not necessarily your retention terms. And again, if retention is a concern and you're not going to learn about something for 45 to 60 days, well, your baseline uh, storage policy should be 60 days recording continuously or 90 days or 120 days recording continuously with motion events turned on. Anyway, I'll get off my high horse for a second. Do you agree? Leave a comment down below. Do you disagree? Leave a comment down below. I'd love to, uh, I'd love to debate this topic with you because it's something that, as you can see, I feel very passionately about. Now, let's jump into Config Tool because we have a lot of ground to cover. Oh, yeah, and one more thing. You, you're probably noticing the turntable with the toy on it. This is going to be our simulation um, environment. So when I'm recording this video, it's nighttime. We're getting through the remnants of Hurricane Ida here in New Jersey. Um, obviously not nearly as bad as, as the folks in Louisiana had experienced it. And, uh, you know, my, my thoughts and prayers go out to everyone that was impacted and affected. But we do have tornado warnings in effect all over the place. It's just it now is not a good time to simulate outdoor video motion. So um, I thought we'd do it more in a controlled environment anyway. So I've got a turntable that I can get to spin and we can uh, simulate some some motion detection. So that is why that is there. If you're wondering why it's a dogfish head uh, brewing company turntable, that's a long story for another day over a beer. So now let's jump into config tool. All right, so we are now in config tool for the in, in the interest of full disclosure. This is Security Center 5.10. Um, I'm getting ready to upgrade actually to 5.10.1, and I have a video coming up soon regarding a new feature called crowd estimation that comes out in 5.10.2. So I'll be upgrading to that as well. Uh, but for this video today, we're going to go into 5.10. And honestly, video motion detection configuration hasn't really changed much since 5.0 that came out ages ago. So um, here in config tool, you want to go to the video task, get to the archiver that's got the camera in it that you want to configure. For me, it's going to be this Bosch Starlight camera. Thank you very much, Bosch Security. Special place in my heart for Bosch. Um, they acquired Sony, who I used to work for. You're going to select the video unit. And then um, I've obviously been messing around with this. It'll, it'll probably start you out here in identity. You want to go to video analytics and select motion detection. Now, obviously, we've done many videos on visual tracking. Uh, we haven't really messed with this stuff. Maybe uh, if you're interested, leave me a comment down below and we'll, we'll get into some of these uh, other analytic features. Now, out of the box, when I added this camera, it was configured this way. So what does this mean? If you get to your camera and it's configured like this out of the box, motion detection is enabled, but the unit is doing it, the camera is doing the motion detection. So here's your first variable, right? So maybe this is the second variable. First variable is, is motion detection even turned on, right? If it's off, it'll look like this. So variable number one, you got to turn the thing on. Variable number two is you need to determine whether you want the archiver role to handle your motion detection, or do you want the unit to configure the motion detection. Now there's two, there, there's advantages to doing it either way. The primary 
advantage to doing it on the archiver to have the archiver role do the motion detection for you is ease of configuration what do i mean by this if i have that set up to unit that means the camera itself which is sitting right here just off camera that you can't see the camera itself is uh, using its onboard video motion detection algorithms to uh, to create the motion based events the camera may actually be better at doing this and by allowing the camera to do it you take resources away from the archiver or in other words the archiver isn't having to process not just the video but also the video motion detection so it it, it alleviates some burden it, it takes some load off of the archiver but the uh the flip side to that is you now have to go into each individual camera by ip address and configure the motion detection utilizing that manufacturer's uh, UI. So if you have uh, an installation, sort of like what you're seeing here, right, where I've got Axis, Bosch, Sony, Hanwha, um, you now have to become masters of setting up motion detection in each one of those manufacturers' different particular ways. I can tell you, as somebody that used to work for a camera manufacturer, I used to work for Sony, the way that Sony does it is completely different than the way that Bosch does it, which is completely different than the way that Hanwha does it. I mean, they're all generally similar, but they're all different as well. Just even getting into the camera, which one requires that you use Chrome, which one requires that you use Internet Explorer, blah, blah, blah. There's so many variables to consider that doing it on the archiver flattens that whole thing out. By allowing the archiver to do it, you will configure each individual camera the same exact way or using this same exact UI, regardless of if it's Axis, Bosch, Hanwha, Panasonic, iPro, whatever, doesn't matter. It's going to be the same. So for our purposes today, we're talking about doing motion detection on the archiver role. One other thing that's interesting about unit, uh, and I'll show you this in security desk. If you look at the Sony camera, which I do have motion detection enabled for, and I'm using the unit to process the motion detection. If you look at this, we could see these green bars are here. We're going to get more into the green bars, but based on the relative amount of motion that the camera sees, I should get different size green bars indicating how much motion is detected in the scene. And you can see, I'm not getting that. I'm just getting that motion happened right? And it's just maxing out these bars. So do I know that motion happened here? Yes. Is it the most uh, helpful thing in the world? No, because I could tell you that not all of this, not all of these motion events, you know, took up the entire screen, which is what this is representing. So even at a per camera level, doing it on the unit will yield you slightly different results every time. So now jumping back here, we're going to select Archiver. And again, out of the box, this is how it was configured for the unit to do it with motion detection turned on. When we change it to Archiver, you see we get a few more options. Before we get into this, I want to direct your attention over here because, again, this is another one of those pet peeves of mine. Default out of the box the always schedule will be used. In other words, when you set up motion and you don't change the schedule, the motion detection grids and the way that you configure the algorithm to run are going to run all the time, regardless of if it's daytime, nighttime, weekend, or whatever other schedules that you have. Motion detection is notoriously bad at night in low light conditions. So it stands to reason that you may want to run motion detection a little bit differently daytime versus nighttime. And I know, you know, setting up motion detection can get to be a slog, especially if you have 500 cameras or 1,000 cameras, but I guarantee you the benefit that you'll receive from setting up motion detection properly on a schedule will yield you fantastic results. But again, the choice is yours. So before we 
mess I'm not really going to mess around too much with schedules. If you did want to do a schedule, you just hit add. And if you have schedules enabled, I've done a video on schedules. I'll leave a, a link down below and up top here um, on how to create schedules. But let's say Monday through Friday, daytime, you wanted to have a different schedule than, um, than maybe Monday through Friday, nighttime. And maybe you really wanted to have a really different schedule on the weekends. And you want to get really crazy, and on Valentine's Day in particular, because I'm having a blood drive that day, I want to have a different motion detection schedule. I mean, you can get really, really granular with this stuff, or you could leave it wide open and, and just have it all run on the always schedule. For our purposes today, we'll just leave it as always. Just know, if you do add a schedule, you're going to have to do everything that, we, that I'm going to show you here today on the always. You'll have to do it again for the different schedule that you select because again the the algorithm is going to work differently on that schedule than it is going to on the always schedule okay so first variable sensitivity out of the box it's always set somewhere around 90 percent. i've seen it 90 or 95 percent and then consecutive frame hits two what does this mean let's look at the uh tech doc hub article on this and I want to read from you right from the source and it says in sensitivity option select how much of a difference must be detected in a block between two consecutive frames before it is highlighted as a motion block a plain image such as viewing an empty wall is more prone to generate noise than an image containing a lot of detail tip first set a high value and then slowly lower it until you are only receiving a few false motion reads in the image. You can also calibrate the sensitivity automatically. We'll get into that in a second. And then it also talks about that consecutive frame hit. In the consecutive frame hits option, select how many frames in a row the motion on threshold must be reached to generate a positive motion hit. So these two uh, functions sort of run in tandem. So they're talking about blocks and frames. If you look really closely at this screen, I'll try to blow this up um, in, in, in the editing process, but you can see there are little boxes here. They're actually 1,350 individual boxes. So when it says, select how much of a difference must be detected in a block between two consecutive frames before it's highlighted as a motion block, what it's, what it's talking about are these individual blocks. What it doesn't really say here is the higher the number, the higher the sensitivity, the more sensitive it is going to be toward motion, okay? So the higher the number, the closer to 100%. At 100%, it detects everything. At 90%, it's a good starting point. Now, you also need two consecutive frame hits. So that block needs to be violated in two consecutive frames in order for motion detection to be turned on, to be enabled. Now, we always start here, right? So if sensitivity is at 90% with two consecutive frame hits and you're good, right? You're not picking up too much video noise or, or you know things aren't triggering, then you can leave it there. By and large though, that sensitivity number needs to come down. Right, and, and that's sort of what they say here in the tip. First, set a high value and then slowly lower it until you're only receiving a few false motion, motion reads in the, in the image. Now, coming down here, the thresholds. Motion on, motion off. What does this mean? This means 20% of the 1,350 blocks need to be violated need to sense motion in just those 264 blocks in order to turn motion detection on. In order for motion detection to turn off, it needs to drop below 132 blocks, okay? Now, again, that's 20% to turn on. We can change this, and we can go all the way up to 1,320, okay, so not 1,350, 1,320. Um, but default out of the box, it's always set at 20%. And then again, same rule down here, 132 blocks need to, uh, 132 blocks or less, 
after a few consecutive frame hits, we'll then turn motion detection off. And that is for motion zone number one. You can have more than one motion zone. So for example, I might only care about where about where the turntable is, right? I don't care about all this other stuff necessarily, or maybe I did have an object that's over here, but I wanna configure the motion detection for motion zone number one to be more sensitive or less sensitive in this region versus in this region up here, for example. So I'll show you, I'll show you that in a second. The other thing, so now that we know what sensitivity is and what consecutive frame hits are, and we know what the thresholds for turning on and turning off are, and we know what the motion detection zones are, well, what about actually configuring the motion detection grid here? So right now, every box is active, okay? How do I know that? Because it's got this weird blue, blue-green tint to it. If I come over here, and I hit clear, you'll see that all goes away. So now none of the boxes are enabled. And you'll also see that these values drop down to zero because these represent the number of boxes that are enabled, right? So if I draw a box on the screen by selecting the rectangle and drawing a box over the turntable, you'll see 20% threshold now means 53 blocks need to be violated okay, which is 20% of this motion detection zone. I hope that makes sense because that, that really sort of, when I was going through certification, that's, that was my aha moment. That was when I was like, oh, I understand. Like, I was like, where is this 264 coming from? Why is that 20%? It's because that threshold is based on the number of blocks that you have selected. So if, if, if I draw more boxes now, 20% is 74 blocks, right? And I can come over here and erase all this. Actually, let me just clear this and redraw this box right here, just to give me the turntable. So now you could see 20% would be 38 blocks. If I made this 100%, it'd be 192 blocks. So every single one of these blocks would need to be violated in order for motion detection to be enabled. That's not really super helpful, right? But you have to determine what is the proper threshold on a per camera basis, right? And th this again gets into that pet peeve of mine because again, motion detection on, turn on on the unit or turn on on the archiver. And I can't tell you how many times I see this, right? This is the, this is the configuration. We're gonna do it on the archiver. We'll leave it at 90% sensitivity, 264 blocks on, 132 blocks off and move on to the next one what good does that do? Because ultimately, you're going to get a lot of false alarms here, right? It's it's going to record constantly, unless you're looking at, at a static image. So you really need to get in here and configure the motion zones. Now for me, again, we'll clear this. I really only care about this area. And maybe I say, all right, well, you know what, 20% is enough, because it's a it's a pretty active zone, two consecutive frame hits, I know I'm going to get a motion on event when that car starts moving, right? I'm not gonna get a motion event anywhere else in this frame because all the archiver is looking for is motion detection in this zone. And then again, my threshold is once this drops below uh, 22 blocks, motion detection will be turned off. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say I'm good with this. I'm gonna hit apply and that's my detection zone. Now, how do we test this? test zone. So by pressing play here, it's now running the algorithm. So we can see motion detection one, motion detection zone one has zero blocks violated because nothing's really moving. Now, caveat, caveat, caveat. I'm moving here and shadows are occurring, right? And you can see because of the pixel change, even though nothing's really happening in this zone, other than me in the background with my shadow arm, <laughs> um, that's causing motion detection to be enabled. I, st I stop moving, you can see it settles right down, right? This is another variable. And this is why just turning on motion detection doesn't work because anything like that is gonna trigger motion, you're gonna have motion detection all the time.
right? So what's the point of, of enabling it? So without me moving though, we can see we, we've got a nice stable image. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to turn on the turntable and get some motion going so we can see exactly how this is supposed to work. So now you can see with it on, we're getting motion. And we can see that it's, it's violating somewhere around 100 and, 100 and some odd boxes in that particular zone. We could see the, um, the boxes that are getting violated and we see the boxes that are not getting violated. Now I'm gonna turn off the turntable, let it settle down, boom, motion is off. Okay, that is, it, that didn't really take us very long to get here, but going through these steps and understanding, here, let me turn, let me hit stop here so we don't see all that noise. Understanding this concept, now you can go back to your cameras and say, okay, I don't need a scene that looks like this because maybe I have trees, I've got an active street, there are people walking around, I'm getting shadows, I'm getting this, I'm getting that. I really only care about this section of the video or maybe multiple sections of the video but are that are disparate, right? This is a pretty tight shot, but if you had a wide shot with you know maybe a parking lot over here and a parking lot over here, but I don't really care about motion in the center, right? These are my primary targets. Well, I can set up two motion detection zones and set up individual sensitivities for each. So let me show you how we do that. So here, I'm going to clear the zone. I'm gonna do the same thing here, All right? We're gonna hit apply. And now I'm gonna come right here and hit add. Now I've got a second motion detection zone. You could see it filled in the whole space by default. We're gonna clear that space and I'm gonna do it for, uh, where's my rectangle? Right up here okay so for all intents and purposes something needs to violate this box by 64 blocks or 20 percent maybe we want to make this even more maybe we want to make it 50 percent so it's got to violate 161 blocks it needs to be a large object that's going to come through this scene for more than two consecutive frames in order to trigger the motion detection and for motion detection to turn off, we'll leave it at 10%. It, once, the, once it drops below 32 blocks, we're gonna be good to go. We're gonna hit apply. Let's hit test zone. Let's turn the turntable on first. And now we're gonna hit test zone. So I am getting a little bit of noise up here, right? And that probably has to do with the fact that the car is throwing off a small shadow or that motion of the turntable might be rocking my table a little bit. So I'm getting minuscule pixel change. So what I can do here is I can hit stop and I'll change my sensitivity. We'll not kick it down a notch. Let's go to 80%, hit apply, test zone. So now we can see it's happening a lot less. And you probably wanna stay here for a little bit and, and let it go just to see if something else is, is going to trigger it. It might be, again, me waving my arm around with my shadow. You see it, it, my shadow is sort of setting it off a little bit. So maybe we'll crank the sensitivity down a little bit more, hit apply. And again, now, now, we're, we're, now we're clean, right? It's violating zero blocks. The car is still moving. The table's still shaking a little bit. I'm still casting a little bit of a shadow, so it's, it's changing the pixels. But for the most part, that to me is good. Now, if I enter the frame, you can see I had to really get in there with my arm and really start moving around in order for the motion detection to pick me up here. And you can see I'm violating 190 blocks, 200 blocks, somewhere around there. Pull my hand out and we're done. So now I've got two motion zones. So I've got motion zone number two here, that's just this area. I've got motion zone one here, that's just this area. And they're picking up two completely different things. One thing that it's not picking up is anywhere that's not this blue zone and this blue zone. So all this other area that I don't really care about, maybe, maybe you're looking at the sky, maybe you're looking at a patch of grass, right or or some sort of uh you know a median on a high i don't care about the motion detection uh of the median on the highway 
So now I've got this thing perfectly tuned. So now let's jump over to Security Desk to see how this looks. So I've got the camera up in Security Desk and I want you to now notice these green bars that are represented on the timeline. If I pull this out, you can see, so in this area right here, this is when I was probably talking through the demo and we hadn't turned motion detection on yet. So I've got white here. Anywhere where you see white means I have video laid down in the timeline. Okay, so I've got video here. I can click over here and, and here I've got video and if I hit play, right, it's, it's just gonna play. There was no motion detection enabled and therefore there are no motion events versus these areas of green. The green indicates that not only did you have motion, but the relative amount of motion that you detected in the scene. Now, I can't tell you how critically important this particular aspect is because if you've got motion detection set up really well, you can come over here to a time and date search and look at your timeline and say, well, gee, if this was two o'clock in the morning, let's say, and I had one spike of motion, well, what the heck was that? And I could very easily come to that point in the video and ascertain what that spike of motion happened to be, right? So incredibly useful tool, again, but it has to be configured correctly. And this gets back to what I was talking about earlier about um, best practices. So best practices, you record 24 seven, but with motion detection enabled, it allows you to get to the point in the video that you want to get to very quickly after the fact. There are other tools that you can use to do this, right? So there's quick search, there's visual tracking, there's scrubbing the timeline, of course. But I can't tell you how many times I've helped an end user resolve an incident just based on the fact that they had motion detection enabled, they were recording 24 seven, and they went to their time and date search and said, Oh, there we go. There, there was that motion event at three o'clock in the morning. What was that? Let's start our investigation there. And sure enough, that's when their incident occurred. Now to drive that point home, if we look at where the timeline is, you can see the, the green is, you know, roughly halfway up, up the bar. It's going to drop down here a little bit because you kind of see it before the, uh, my shadow was being cast. So it was kicking up a little bit more motion. Now with me being perfectly still and just the car moving, we didn't really pick up a lot of motion, right? Other than this this car in this small section of the screen. Now you could see here, we're about to get to a point where we have increased motion. There's my hand. So now we can see not only was the car moving that was violating a very small bit of the motion detection grid, but now my hand came in and started violating other parts of the picture, thereby giving me more visual representation via that green bar of exactly how much motion was being detected at that particular point in time. So now that you've configured motion detection, you can start doing other stuff with it, right? So motion detection, as we can see here, is an event. Motion on is the event. Motion off is the event that is going to tell security center to take an action if you configure it you can make it so that instead of the motion on uh, event trigger you can have pretty much any of these other event triggers um, you know be the thing that uh, that gets activated but for our intents and purposes that's a different video for our intents and purposes we're just going to talk about motion if we come over to identity and we go to our actions window and I want to add an action when motion on take some action. And I think I counted these once as like 200 different actions. The most common one is add a bookmark to which camera? Well, to the Bosch Starlight camera. And what's your message? Motion detected. And we can, again, change the schedule. So I only want this bookmark to be dropped on the weekends, for example. Uh, because you know, there's always going to be motion detection, uh, motion detected during the week because there's people coming in and out of my facility, but on the weekend, my facility should be pretty quiet. Maybe I want to drop a bookmark either to be run later as a bookmarks report, or just again, as a visual indicator to a guard, we can hit save here. We can also come over here and say when motion enabled or motion on do something else. 
right? So if this was a critical camera, you could trigger an alarm if you wanted to, set a threat level, send an email, right? Run a pattern on a PTZ camera. Go to a preset on a PTZ camera. Display the entity in security desk. So when motion is enabled on this camera, send it to an operator. If you've got a live operation center and you wanted to show somebody every time motion is detected, maybe you have a vault camera, maybe you have a camera in a really highly sensitive area where there shouldn't be a lot of motion being detected. That's a great one. But you can see you've got a number of different options just based on turning the motion on on a camera. You can't do this if your camera is constantly triggering motion, right? If you just left it at 90%, two consecutive frame hits on the whole scene, you're gonna get constant video and you're gonna be always dropping these bookmarks or doing these events. It's gonna become background noise. It's not gonna work very well and, and forget about it. It's just not gonna get used. Whereas if the motion detection is configured correctly and it's going to give you very few false alarms, this type of information can become very, very useful metadata for you your operators and your compliance officers. So now that we've enabled this, let's go over to Security Desk and you can see it's now dropping bookmarks on the timeline whenever it detected motion. So again, maybe this is relevant for you, maybe it's not, but I can tell you where it is relevant. If you have reports configured for specifically bookmarks, we can mine a lot of metadata out of those bookmarks. So here's a simple one that, that I've saved. It's a bookmarks line chart uh, for, for my federated areas. And I don't care about the video necessarily, but what I'm looking for here is in this federated area, every time the word motion is dropped as a bookmark, which I know all of these cameras are set up to drop a bookmark that says motion detected every time motion is detected, over the last seven days, again, I don't care about the video, but if I come over here to charts, and I say, you know what? Break this down for me by the hour. So now I can see across these three cameras exactly how much motion I'm getting across the these last few hours. If I had more data here, or if I went back further in time, I could break this down by the day, by the week, by the month, by the year. This becomes very valuable data to people inside your organization that want to know how many, where are people traveling in my facility? This is a very common question. And how do you know that? You could check your access control logs, but if I swipe my card and 15 people come in behind me, you don't really know. Whereas with this, this will sort of give you a general idea of how many people are flowing through areas or how much motion is being detected, let's say in a parking lot. So I could say, you know what? I have got a peak time in this lot of 12 o'clock on a pretty routine basis. So I wanna maybe reconfigure the lot or deploy more um, you know, officers for issuing citations or for enforcement or for directing traffic or for whatever it is. But this metadata then becomes quite useful. But again, it all comes back to configuring the motion detection correctly because if it's not and you're getting constant motion events, this information is completely irrelevant. So video motion detection, I have very strong feelings on this topic. After this simulation, I hope that you've been able to better understand how it works and maybe can make some tweaks and changes to your own systems or to your customers' systems that will make their operations a lot more efficient. What do you think, folks? I, I shared some pretty strong opinions in this episode. Leave me a comment down below. Agree? Disagree? Would you like to see motion detection done in a different way? Uh, maybe as a feature request, leave me a comment down below. Did you like this video? Give me a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe. Hit that bell notification to, uh, to receive alerts when, uh, hey, maybe we could drop a bookmark on your timeline. But hit that bell notification to, uh, to receive uh, updates on when we release new videos. Again, I'm, I'm attempting to do this uh, twice a month, once every two weeks, hopefully through the rest of 2021. My name's Phil Coppola. I'm the account executive for the public sector in the great state of New Jersey for Genetech. I hope you enjoyed this video and we'll see you on the next one.